The historic town of Rye in Sussex is the perfect getaway for visitors wanting to soak up the atmosphere of quaint streets and picturesque buildings. And the Mermaid Inn, sitting on Mermaid Street, is as popular as ever, with tourists wanting to spend the night in an authentic, centuries-old inn. But some guests at the Mermaid Inn find that their cosy little getaway has turned into a nightmare, when terrifying paranormal activity keeps them awake at night. But it's a quiet little town, there really is nowhere to go. So if you find yourself at the centre of a ghostly reenactment of a sword fight, where your sleep is interrupted by phantom figures watching you from across the room, you're pretty much trapped until morning inside a place teeming with dark history. Because in centuries gone by, the Mermaid Inn was once a safe place for smugglers, ruthless men who made their fortune in blood and betrayal. Some say their ghosts are still among those who linger there, along with their unfortunate victims, leaving some staff members so terrified by what they've experienced that they've quit on the spot. But what is it about the Mermaid Inn that makes it such a magnet for paranormal activity? Is it just the sheer age of the building having seen centuries of life and death? Or is there something else going on, waiting in the shadows for the next unsuspecting guest to check in for the night? I mean, just look at the Mermaid Inn. It certainly looks the part of an old haunted building. The kind of place that you'd walk by and think, oh yeah, there's definitely a ghost staring at me from those windows. And you never know, you might be right. And the inn standing here today dates back to 1420, with a little bit more added in the 1500s. But the history actually goes all the way back to 1156, when Rye was this bustling seaside town with a super busy port. And I know it doesn't look like it now because it's actually a couple of miles away from the coast nowadays, but back then it was on the sea. And we know it was most definitely an inn by 1300, as it's recorded as costing one penny for a bed for the night. It's just a price you can't sniff at, isn't it? And it brews its own beer, so naturally, the inn was a hit with sailors. However, because of Rye's location, being in that area where the English Channel is so narrow, the south of England is so close to the north of France. Back then, the French were partial to sailing over and raiding the town from time to time. In 1377, during a particularly nasty raid by the French, they actually ended up burning down pretty much the entire town, barring only the church and the castle. For obvious reasons, as naturally, they were the only buildings made out of stone, but everything else, including the Mermaid Inn, went up in flames. In 1420 though, they were finally able to rebuild, and they used the surviving cellars that had made it through the fire. So the new building stood on exactly the same footprint as the old one, with a few extra extensions and additions in the 16th century. But it went right back to being a popular inn for anyone passing through the town. And I mean anyone. There's a room that's now called Dr. Sin's Lounge, but back in the 16th century, it was actually used as a little chapel for Catholic priests who were trying to escape to the continent when Catholicism was outlawed in the 1530s. And that's why if you look closely, you can see carving on the wood panelling that says JHS, which stands for Jesus Hominum Salvator, the translation of that being Jesus, Saviour of Man. The inn has been super popular with big names too over the years. On the 27th of August 1597, the William Shakespeare was paid 20 shillings for a performance at the Mermaid Inn. And then apparently Queen Elizabeth I, she may have dined here sometime in 1573 too. I mean, it doesn't get more highbrow than the literal Queen of England, so there's that. But the inn did also have connections to persons lower down the social hierarchy. Smugglers, in particular. During the 18th century, things got bad. Thanks to sky-high taxes, normal things like tea, sugar and tobacco were just prohibitively expensive. And so quite quickly, a lucrative market opened up for enterprising persons who could procure said everyday items at a lower cost to the end buyer. Obviously, the average Joe isn't going to go ratting on smugglers. They're getting things for cheaper rather than paying extortionate taxes. So smuggling was big business if you could get into it, but it was cutthroat, in some cases literally. The Hawkehurst gang was a huge smuggling ring. I'd read somewhere that it was made up of something like 600 men, and their main base of operations was Hawkehurst, which is a little village in Kent, but their territory spanned from Kent to Dorset. It was absolutely huge, and so they would use the Mermaid Inn as a convenient little meeting spot for the gang. And not only was it convenient because it was close to the coast, but the Mermaid Inn also apparently had a network of underground tunnels, with one allegedly connecting the Mermaid Inn to another inn in the town, the Old Bell Inn, which would be super handy for moving their smuggled goods about the place, but would also be good for slipping out of a building unnoticed if they needed to make a hasty escape at any point. Not that these Hawkehurst men were scared of anything, they were vicious, ruthless. It was even said that they'd be in the Mermaid just hanging out with their guns on the table for anyone to see, and no one would dare say anything to them, not even magistrates, nothing. They were untouchable. Because if someone did say something, they would nail you alive to your own front door, allegedly. There was a story about one guy 
guy who found out the hard way about the inner workings of the Hawkehurst gang, a man called James Marshall. He'd started to get a bit too curious about the gang's activities, asking a few too many questions, hanging about a bit too close, until one day James just disappeared, was never seen again. And another story went on to say that a guy called Richard Hawkins was accused of stealing some of the gang's smuggled tea, and so naturally, the gang killed him, only to apparently find out sometime later that actually, they'd just miscounted their tea. No one had stolen anything. And so I'm gonna guess Richard had told them that over and over again with increasing alarm, but of course, they hadn't listened to him. The Hawkehurst gang had been on a roll from 1735 until about 1749, when the law finally caught up to them. Two of the gang's leaders, Arthur Gray and Thomas Kingsmill, they were caught and executed in 1748 and 1749 respectively, and a further 73 gang members were rounded up and hanged too, which really brought an end to the Hawkehurst gang's operation. After the days of the smugglers, the Mermaid Inn carried on operating as an inn for a couple of decades until 1770, and we know that by 1847 it was listed as a private house, so someone was just living in it instead. But then by 1913, it had become a club. It was owned by a woman called May Aldington, who was an author in her own right, but she also was the mother of Richard Aldington, who had written the book Death of a Hero, about the disillusionment and devastation caused by World War One. A bit later on, during World War II, the Mermaid Inn was used as a billet for Canadian troops. And a billet just means a place where soldiers are temporarily housed, it was happening all over the country with civilian properties, they were just being taken over to give troops a place to stay, but there was one Canadian soldier who seemingly enjoyed his time staying at the Mermaid Inn so much that after the war he actually came back and brought the place. And so the inn continued through the 20th century. In 1982 it hosted a luncheon for Her Majesty the Queen Mother, as she'd been named the Lord Warden of the Sink Ports, so that's a pretty big deal. And it's still no stranger to other celebrities too, Pierce Brosnan, Johnny Depp, Dame Judi Dench, like they've all visited, and of course you can too. They have 31 rooms that you can book, or if you just fancy a good pub lunch and a beverage, that's cool too. It's been owned by Judith Blinko since 1993, when she brought it with a guy called Robert Pimwell, but it looks like he's since stepped down and Judith is still running the show. And so if you go into the Mermaid Inn today, obviously you'll step over the threshold and into a completely different era in time altogether. It's got that proper old boozer vibe. But there are also a couple of bits and pieces that hint towards its more otherworldly reputation. If you look up, you might see what looks like huge great big Christmas baubles hanging from the ceiling. And they're not those security mirrors that you sometimes see in corner shops or whatnot. They're actually called witch balls, and the idea was that if a witch walked past the inn and decided to throw a curse on the building, these balls would reflect the curse back to her, and so protect the building from bad energy with a kind of like Uno reverse card. And side note, this theory is the reason why we put baubles on our Christmas trees, because the pretty shinies reflect and repel negative energies. As well as that, if you know where to look, you can also see remnants from the all too real history of the inn, as it's got a few secret passages too. There's a secret staircase between the bar and Dr. Sin's bedchamber, hidden behind a fake bookshelf. There's also a moving panel in room 18, and an entrance to a priest hole through the back of the cupboard above the bar's fireplace. You know, just in case you're a smuggler needing to run from the law, or you're a guest trying to run from the ghosts. Either way, you've got options. And so while nowadays the full-on underground secret tunnels have been filled in, there's no flintlock pistols left out on the bar, and you've got more chance of crashing a wedding reception than a fight to the death, that seemingly hasn't stopped the Mermaid Inn's history from making its presence known over and over again. And there are so many stories surrounding just a few of the 31 rooms, so let's start there first. <laughs> starting conveniently enough with guest room number one, known as the James. And every room in the inn is named after a particular person who's significant in Rye, so James came from the Mayor of Rye between 1996 and 98, Charles James, and the bed in this room? Ridiculously cool if you like to nerd out over history like me. It's been dated to 1660, and still has the holes in the bed frame from where the ropes used to go through to hold your mattress, so there's that. But there's also a couple of ghost stories attached to this room too. People have reported seeing a lady in white, but sometimes she appears as a grey colour instead, just mixing it up. But the story goes that she used to be a barmaid at the inn during the 18th. 16th century, right around the time of the Hawkehurst gang. Just like any tragic ghost story, this woman had fallen in love with one of the Hawkehurst smugglers. And just like anyone who gets in a new relationship, you're all smitten, you want to tell the world about your new love. Only when your other half is a ruthless smuggler, that doesn't sit well with your boyfriend's gang. So apparently this poor woman was murdered by the Hawkehurst men for basically not keeping her mouth shut. And so now she's been seen sitting in the chair by the fireplace in the James room. But then other guests who report weird goings on, they don't see this lady in white. Instead, they report that if they leave their clothes on this particular chair overnight, when they wake up in the morning, their clothes will be wet. There's no leak, there's no open window, it doesn't happen anywhere else in the room, so it can't be condensation or anything like that. It's just all around a bit strange. Other times, guests will say that their clothes have been moved
moved in the middle of the night off this chair and onto another one and apparently this has actually caused arguments between couples because they're adamant that the other one must have moved the clothes in the middle of the night they're like there's no other explanation the inn has switched out the chairs over the years and so it doesn't seem to be tied to one particular chair it's just whatever chair is in the right hand side but besides the lady in white and maybe some soggy drawers in the morning you might also be disturbed by a ghostly family because there was once a couple staying in this room and they were woken up in the middle of the night to see a man a woman and a kid walking through their room they walked from one side of the room to the other before just disappearing through the wall it would be really interesting to know which particular wall they walked through though like maybe it was an interior wall and there used to be a doorway there centuries ago that would be cool to find out the next room i need to tell you about is room three also known as morton as mr morton was the leader of the groombridge gang but he was also known to ride with a hawkehurst lot as well and there was this one story of a husband and wife staying in this room and the wife had just gone to the bathroom leaving the husband alone in the bed all of a sudden he feels this almighty kick against his back followed by this overwhelming sense of calm and well-being which are not two things that you would usually put together being kicked in the back by something you can't see but there you go the husband then reported that as soon as the wife came back into the room the atmosphere instantly turned back to normal so if you want kicks and good vibes the morton is the room for you and then heading upstairs to room five aka the nutcracker suite which is a brilliant name as it's up in the rafters of the building and there are low beams so be careful you don't smack your head and crack your nut on the wooden beams imaginative humorous i love it and similarly to the james room a lady in white has been seen here too and she'll be walking across the room but she'll stop at the end of the bed for just a minute before carrying on and disappearing through the door some people believe that she's the same barmaid from the james room but then i saw that a medium had come in and said that no no this was actually a french woman and she'd been kidnapped by a member of the hawkehurst gang she'd been pregnant given birth and unfortunately lost the baby and now she's just stuck at the mermaid forever searching for her lost child just super upset and cannot move on so whether she is a love-struck barmaid or a sad french mother we don't really know and i don't think we're ever going to really moving on to room seven georgina named after the daughter of robert pinwill who owned the inn along with judith until 2012 this one doesn't have a specific ghost story attached to it but i did see a comment from a guest who had stayed here and said that his kettle switched on by itself is it a helpful ghost making sure the guests are well looked after or dodgy electrics in an old building then we've got room 10 also known as the fleur de lys because of the connection that ryan france have had over the years raiding pillaging and burning down the town included i guess and in this one similarly to the james room again a bank manager and his wife were staying here when in the middle of the night both of them were woken up as apparently the figure of a man just casually walked through the bathroom wall right through the room and then out through the opposite wall and this terrified them so much and really i cannot blame them for this they just legged it out of their rooms in their gym jams and went and spent the rest of the night downstairs in one of the lounges when staff found them downstairs in the morning they were a bit like are you guys okay are you good you need anything they told the staff that they were not going back up into that room for love nor money not even in the cold hard safe light of day they're not setting foot back in that room and so the porter had to go and grab all of their luggage and the pair got changed in the lounge before checking out rather hastily and then the next room that i need to tell you about is room 15 called dr sin's bed chamber not named after a real doctor he's actually a fictional character from russell thorndyke's dr sin of romney marsh book who to give you the gist of it was a guy who was happy living out his days as a vicar until his wife left him for one of his mates and so he went to go track them down had a bunch of adventures became a pirate captain and so that's how he has ties with the mermaid as the novels mention the hawkehurst gang and with the stories of smuggling and whatnot and in this room the one with the secret bookshelf passageway very strange things have allegedly happened a filming crew were in here once and they would picked up orbs on the camera and on its own no nah, it doesn't do it for me and just while we're here orbs how do you feel about them because i just think most of the time they're dust particles rather than anything else i am yet to see a really compelling case for them but let me know your thoughts but there was once a seance held in this room and a medium and a group of staff members including the owner judith they were all involved and so they all sat down the medium gets going and then they mention oh by the way if i end up making contact with someone my face and voice are going to change just a heads up <laughs> excuse me what now but then it actually happens judith and the staff members see the medium's face change and in a voice that did not sound like their normal voice, the medium said that there was a figure in the room with them who also had a dog. The group couldn't see the figure and the dog, but when they got up to go to the corner where the medium had told them that they were, they put their hand out. And apparently, every single one of them felt the sensation of stroking dog's fur. And they actually saw, with their own eyes, their hand disappear into what seemed like a shadow, which is very strange. But guests staying in this room have described seeing a rather stout, portly man in here, and whenever he's noticed he does his best homer simpson impression and just fades back into the oak paneling as if he was never there but now we come on to 
what is, from what I can see, the most famous room, room 16, the Elizabethan bedchamber. Called as such is a bit of a nod towards Queen Elizabeth I stopping off here. And the ghost story surrounding this room is that if you're in here on the 29th of October, you may find yourself the witness of a sword fight. We don't know who these guys are, there is no record of a duel going on in this room that I know of, but it's been witnessed multiple times. On the 29th of October 1913, Mrs. Oldington, remember her, she woke up in that room to find the duel raging around her bed. Full on combat. And these two men, they were dressed in doublets and hose, so that outfit puts them anywhere in between the 14th and the 17th century. But she could hear the metal of the swords crashing the lot. All of a sudden, one of the men runs his sword through the other and the fatally wounded man falls to the ground. The victor drags his dead opponent's body over to where there is a secret passageway in that room and throws him down. And that's where the manifestation ends, it fades away. Peter Underwood, he mentioned this ghostly sword fight in one of his books. He claimed to hear stories of this same phenomena being witnessed multiple times during the 70s and 80s, and it almost always seemed to be the 29th of October. Although there was a woman, Kiki Kendrick, who was staying with her husband in that room in December 1993, and having allegedly not heard the stories at all, she woke up to the sounds of those swords, and two men quite clearly exerting themselves, huffing and puffing, trying to, you know, not die while killing the other. And as her eyes adjusted, she swore that she could see the shadows of those two locked in this fight. So maybe you don't need to rush to book the Elizabethan chamber on the 29th of October, specifically next year. But another really interesting detail to this whole ghostly duel thing is that where that little secret passageway is, where the guy had been thrown down, that still exists and leads to the bar area. And one day, there was a staff member who was doing something at the opposite end of the room, downstairs, tending to the fireplace or whatnot, when all of a sudden, all of the bottles that were on a shelf next to where that passageway came out fell to the floor, completely smashed. It caused a huge, great big noise noise, massive mess, and strangely enough, would have been the damage done if, I don't know, say a body had been thrown down that passageway? Like that's where it would have all landed, it would have taken out all of those bottles. That staff member <laughs> took one look at all of the bottles smashed on the floor, and whether it was because of the ghosts and he was so creeped out, or because he was just not cleaning that up, he just got up and walked out, just quit on the spot. Yeah, fair. But even if this fight is not seen, guests staying here claim to hear these swords crashing against each other, and someone said up a night vision camera and swore that they captured what looked to be two shadowy figures fighting. Although I didn't find the actual footage so I can't say much more on that one. Another couple were staying at the mermaid and the Elizabethan chamber was their room and they'd just gone out for a walk around the town but as they walked back to the inn they just so happened to look up at the window to their room from the outside and they saw the silhouettes of people moving inside their room. When they got back to their room obviously there was no one in there. Maybe they got the room window wrong? Who knows but I would feel a bit disconcerted myself if I saw that too knowing that I'm going to be sleeping in there at night. But there's other things reported in this room too. A man's been seen wearing a striped nightgown and cap, and he walks past the bottom of the bed carrying a candle. And the door has been known to swing open on occasion, which is not a regular thing, like you'd expect because the building is uneven and that causes it. But apparently it just happens randomly every now and then. But even if you're not staying in the famously haunted bedchamber, there are still more rooms where you might encounter something weird. Room 17 is known as the Kingsmill Room, named after one of the infamous leaders of the Hawkehurst gang, Thomas Kingsmill. And out of all the haunted rooms at the Mermaid Inn, for some reason this is the room that cleaning staff refused to work in alone. They would only go in there in pairs. So that's never a good sign that you're going to have a lovely and uninterrupted night's sleep, is it? And this Kingsmill room is said to be haunted by a woman who was the wife of the gang leader Arthur Gray, or Kingsmill himself. The story varies slightly. And one of the most common phenomena reported in here is that the rocking chair will start rocking all on its own. And it's more than just, oh, someone's walking past on the rickety floorboards outside the room and that's starting the rocking chair off. More like there is someone invisible sitting in there and that terrifies me to think about, you know? This rocking chair caused so much commotion with guests that for a time they actually took it out of the room. But then as paranormal folk were never too far away and people were going into the inn asking for the rocking chair to be put back in so they could experience it for themselves. And so now I believe the chair is available on request, but if you'd rather not, no worries. There was also a story from a guest staying in this room and he was having a really rough night. It was boiling hot, he could not get comfortable no matter what he did, when all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, he heard a knocking at the door, followed by the latch shaken about. That was then followed by big heavy footsteps walking across the room. So whatever it is, it is now inside the room with you, before stopping at the fireplace. 
No thank you, mister. Other guests have claimed to feel their feet being pulled while they're lying in bed. So I guess it could always be worse than just hearing disembodied footsteps. The Sun newspaper, everyone's favourite reliable news source, even decided to get in on the action at the Mermaid Inn. They had reporters stay in the King's Mill room. And so they'd got their camera set up, ready to record anything that happened during the night. But when they went to review the footage in the morning, they found that the camera's tape had ejected itself. Apparently, this would have taken a hard push of the button to do this, and the battery was fully charged, like all of this sort of stuff. But like I say, it came from the sun, so take from that what you will. Not mentioning the fact that this article was published in 2018, and who even has a camcorder that uses a cassette tape anymore in 2018? But I digress. Moving on to room 19, the Hawkehurst suite, named obviously after the Hawkehurst gang. And first of all, I just want to point out something that I found a little bit odd about this room, because this is the last haunted guest room that I've got to share with you. However, the older ghost books I used, they don't talk about the Hawkehurst suite. They talk about room 18, the Rye Royal room, being the haunted one. And the information in these older sources was that the guest would apparently report seeing an old-fashioned man just sitting at the end of their beds. But then by 2002, when Most Haunted came to the Mermaid Inn, Yvette even says on the program, I'm assuming they had a tour off camera or whatever, she said that room 18 wasn't a haunted room and that instead it was room 19, the Hawkehurst suite they focused on instead. So I just thought I'd point that out anyway. But either way, whether the numbers have got mixed up over the years or what, there are now witness stories from the Hawkehurst suite. There was once a guest from America sleeping in here when she claimed to see the old fashioned gentleman sitting at the end of her bed in room 19. And so she did what any rational person would do, she dragged her mattress through into her son's bedroom and spent the rest of the night sleeping on her mattress on the floor of her son's room instead. Certainly cannot blame her for that one. <laughs> so whether it's the Rye Royal or the Hawkehurst, you may have your own personal night watchman if you stay in either of these rooms. But even if you're not staying the night in one of the guest rooms, it doesn't need to be the middle of the night for you to experience something unexplained. Patrick, the night porter, he was interviewed by those Sun reporters because he'd been at the inn for 14 years by that point. And he went on to say that there was one night in November 2016, he was just in the bar area with a few other guests and the barman, when all of a sudden the latch to the back door lifted up by itself and this heavy wooden door swung open with force. There was no way that this was anything to do with the wind. This was a door where you needed to put some real effort into opening it. So immediately Patrick runs out to check that it wasn't kids messing about and the barman runs out the front door to catch anyone who might be sneaking around that way, but they meet up outside, neither one having seen another living soul. But by far, all of the stories I read about the Mermaid Inn, there was this one that really creeped me out and kind of honestly broke my heart too. It's so sad. So in December 2000, it was the night before this guest's wedding and they were stopping at the Mermaid Inn. Their soon-to-be brother-in-law was walking towards them down the corridor from the bar into the reception area. Only they didn't recognise him as their brother-in-law because his face looked completely different. His eyes were all hollow, his cheekbones sunken in, he looked skeletal like he had no weight on him at all. And it was only when he said their name that they actually recognised him as who he was. The next day at the wedding, he looked completely back to normal full round face, all good. But in the three months after the wedding, the brother-in-law got diagnosed with liver cancer and actually passed away. And as he was in his final days, his face looked just how he had appeared at the Mermaid Inn because the cancer had just stripped all the weight off him. And that story, that just gives me real chills to think about, honestly. Almost like an absolutely awful, awful premonition on what was going to happen in just three months as well. It's horrible. And while not everyone has such a traumatising, potentially paranormal story to share from the inn, other visitors have also reported strange things. There was once a guest who was checking in and they just so happened to check their reflection in the mirror and they saw someone behind them just wearing modern day clothes. Thinking nothing of it, just assuming it was a staff member for the hotel, they carried on. Only when they turned around not that long after, they saw that there was actually no one behind them. And then there's the phantom smell of cigar smoke. Smoking has been banned in pubs since 2007. Could it have maybe seeped into the timbers? Yeah, potentially. I don't really know. But there are others that believe it is an echo of the days where the hall Hurst gang would gather, smoking cigars, drinking beer, and terrifying the locals with threats of bloody violence. So while you enjoy your pint in the bar after you've checked in for the night, maybe keep an eye on the other patrons around you, as they may disappear without paying their tab. Or even worse, you might be seeing their shadowy figures standing at the foot of your bed, staring at you at three in the morning. Unless you're into that, of course. But do you think that the Mermaid Inn is as haunted as the stories would have you believe? Or is it another place where the stories have taken on a life of their own over the decades? For me, it follows pretty much the same sense 
sentiments as any pub I cover, really. Its whole shtick is selling alcohol, obviously, so people could be seeing things because of a different type of spirits. It also has its own ghost stories on the website itself. It's being visited by ghost TV shows. There is an element of paranormal tourism going on here. So ghosts are in the mermaid's financial interests too. However, I do feel like this one has the ghost to back it up myself. Having such a connection to a notorious gang like the Hawkehurst, the centuries of history on this site, not just from this building, but the building before it burned down in 1377, I think it's more than reasonable to speculate that there definitely could be one or two echoes of something hanging around here. What I did find really interesting though is that there wasn't really any mention of anything overtly negative here. There aren't any angry men, any violent entities, anything that makes me think that the members of the Hawkehurst gang themselves are actually haunting the inn. Even the sword fight, their fashion is too early to be the time of the smugglers, so that was an interesting one. Because it is written in sources that perhaps the ghosts of the smugglers were haunting the Mermaid Inn. But if anything, that would have been the lowest hanging fruit for the Mermaid Inn to make up a ghost story about. So there's definitely brownie points to be had there and makes me want to put more stock in the other stories just a little bit more. But anyway, I'd be up for staying the night in the Elizabethan chamber on the 29th of October one year. But as always though, do let me know your thoughts. And if you enjoyed this story, please do hit the like button for me. And if you fancy subscribing but you haven't yet, maybe you'd like to do that too. And one more thing, it's Halloween in a couple of days and I know a lot of you lovely weirdos out there probably already have plans. And let me know what fun things you're up to if you do. But if you don't have any plans just yet, then I have a fun Halloween treat for you. We started the month with the super epic cool Epping Forest on location video. And if you haven't seen that one yet, first of all, what are you doing? But I thought it was only right to give you something, okay, maybe not quite so special, but pretty cool nonetheless. So I'm bringing you a bumper episode. I don't even know how long it's gonna be just yet, but it's gonna be a beefy story that I am very excited to tell you all about. So for now, I'm gonna say that that is all from me. I cannot wait to chat with you more about the morbid, mysterious and macabre. So until next time, sleep safe. Or if you just fancy a bub, a bub, a bub, a, I'm having a stroke. A good pub lunch. It's a good pub lunch. Everyone loves a good pub lunch. What's your favorite pub lunch meal though? What do you normally go for? Mine's normally something in chips. Cause if I'm going out, I'm not going out and having a salad, you know?